Before we go to Bruce Watson, I wanted to go back to Jerry Mitchell on that list of the unsolved murders. On that day, as they were dredging up, in the days that they were looking for the three civil rights workers, they were dredging up black body after black body. These are the unsolved murders. Talk about who we don't know um, died and who killed them. And that's part of the problem, is that there's really never been an attempt to go out and, and account for these. I, I mean, there, it seems every day there seems to be another case uh, that resurfaces around the country. I mean, not just in Mississippi, but around the entire country. And, uh, and so that's why it's important. There needs to be accounting. There needs to be, uh, uh, you know, some attempt to come back and, and, and document each one of these cases, who was killed and what the circumstances were, even if, if justice can't be brought in these cases, uh, because it's very important. It's like in Kansas City, there was a, a, a case, a civil rights case there that's now been reopened, uh, killing that took place in 1970. So it, it's, like I said, it's happening all over the country because people just haven't really thought about it, haven't been aware of it, but uh, there were killings that took place and people just, you know, people disappeared in places like Mississippi and, and, and weren't heard from anymore. And uh, Jerry Mitchell, um, Ben Cheney referred a, a few minutes earlier to the Sovereignty Commission. Could you explain what the, the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission was and its role in this uh, reign of terror that existed back in the 60s? Well, it was it, basically the Sovereignty Commission uh, was kind of part of the reason Mississippi was kind of a police state in those days. It was created, it was kind of the state's answer to the White Citizens Council, kind of a state authorized White Citizens Council. Uh, it was headed by the governor, no less, uh, and some of those powerful lawmakers. And basically, uh, they had one arm that was kind of like a propaganda arm. They, they would reach out up north and places and they would uh, promulgate segregation and say, send black speakers up north, pay them and say, uh, tell them how great segregation is and how you, you want segregation too. And then they had this other arm that was kind of a spy arm where they basically infiltrated civil rights groups and uh, were able to get that information. And they kind of shared all this information with law enforcement across the state. And of course, unfortunately, a number of these law enforcement in places like we're talking about uh, Neshoba County and Meridian, a lot of those guys were Klansmen. So they were literally sharing information with some of these same Klansmen who, of course, uh, uh, wound up being involved in, in the killing of these kids. Let's go back to Neshoba. Speaking here is Rita Bender, the widow of Michael Schwerner, and Fannie Lee Cheney, the mother of James and Ben Cheney. This case has gotten the attention it has gotten because two of the three men were right. And it's no secret, the world's supposed to know. If it hadn't been for Mickey Swan and Andrew Goodman, my son wouldn't have been known, wouldn't have been found today. I think that says a lot about attitudes about race and who's important and whose mother's son matters more. An excerpt of Neshoba. Um, the Price of Freedom, the film opening tonight. And we are going to Bruce Watson, who has written the book Just Out, Freedom Summer, the Savage Season that Made Mississippi Burn and that Made America a Democracy. The significance of this summer, what these three men and so many others died for. Bruce Watson. I think it's important that we put this in the context of the entire summer, as you said. Uh, we mentioned briefly that, uh, that this was part of Freedom Summer, but we, often the story of Freedom Summer is, not, is overshadowed by the murders, and it makes it seem as though the men died in vain. In fact, they were a part of an enormous and incredibly inspiring effort in which 700 college students went to Mississippi, went to the dangerous hellhole of Mississippi that summer to, uh, to live with black people, to register, to live in their shacks, sit on their porches, talk to them, register them to vote when that was possible, and teach in freedom schools, hundreds of freedom, dozens of freedom schools with 2,000 students, teaching them black history, black literature, things that had never been taught in Mississippi. It was a revolutionary effort. Very important not to forget that part of the story. 
And of course, uh, Mississippi was the the birthplace of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and and the and it had in essence an impact on the national debate within the Democratic Party, didn't it? Oh yes, that was another part of Freedom Summer was the Freedom Democratic Party set up as a parallel party because, of course, only seven percent of African Americans could vote in Mississippi at that time—a shockingly low number, uh, much lower than the rest of the South. So Bob Moses and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had set up this parallel party to get people to who couldn't go to the courthouse, who who were afraid to go to the courthouse, to just sign a form and become members. And then they sent 67 delegates that they chose in their own parallel conventions. They sent them to Atlantic City to the. Democratic National Convention, where they challenged the all-white delegation and said, "We are the rightful, we are the rightful Democrats from Mississippi," and they waged a high-profile, uh, nationally televised uh, hearing in which Fannie Lou Hamer gave a stirring speech, saying, "Is this America? Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our phones off the hook because we just want to be decent citizens?" And they made that challenge, trying to get seated. And of course, LBJ was terrified there'd be a walkout, and uh, they they quashed the challenge, but. They did get the guarantee. The Freedom Democratic Party got the guarantee that there would never again be a segregated delegation seated at a Democratic National Convention, and there never was. So another victory for Freedom Summer. Ben, how has this uh, inspired you to do the work you do? In a minute, we want to go back to Edgar Ray Killen, who is alive and who has served a couple of years in jail so far. Well, the inspiration, I think, came um, knowing that it doesn't take a lot of people to make a whole lot of change, and that's a good thing. So what we do is we form coalitions like with David, and we make change. Uh, I think what's important, I think one thing, one part of the discussion we're missing here is that what took place in the 60s was not just some group of evil people committing murders. It was sustained, it was sanctioned by the state government. Otherwise, these murders would not have occurred. And I think if we can draw a parallel to the Solomon Commission in Mississippi, to the Cointel Pro that, took, that was in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, you know, people died as a result of Jagger Hoover. And I think that, um, I think we need to think about America so this thing doesn't happen. It could happen again. So it does happen again on no level. We need to have, a, again, a serious discussion about race. Mickey, how did you get Edgar Ray Killen to talk so much? <clears throat> when he got indicted, there was a window of opportunity where we were offered one interview in his lawyer's office. Uh, we, of course, took that interview, and the parameters were you can't talk about the Klan, you can't talk about the murders, you can't talk about anything. And basically, it was about a two-hour interview of him saying how innocent he was. Now. Filmmakers, journalists, reporters have tried to get to him for 40 years, and, of course, he never let that happen, because he's got an ego that's so tremendous. When that interview ended, I knew we had an interview, we had him on tape, but we did not have the interview. And I went up to him and I said, Edgar, you know, you've never told the truth of your story. I'm a filmmaker. We want to get to your truth. He said, what are you doing tomorrow morning? We were invited over to his house, and that be turned into five months of interviews. Hmm. Well, in the documentary, uh, Edgar Ray Killen openly defends his segregationist views, but denies he killed the three civil rights workers. A mulatto, in reality, the family don't want him, the country don't want him. So I am, I don't deny under any conditions that I have been a segregationist. The whites that wanted to integrate so bad was because that they wanted to live like the blacks generally did. Most of them was as immoral as you could imagine. The blacks would very openly tell you here, if you hadn't been a nigger one Saturday night, you had never really lived. Just because I don't believe that the black and the white need to marry and mix and mingle uh, in the, all their life, social and whatnot, that don't mean I said, let's go out and shoot somebody.
I want to ask you, it's been said that he's a very charming individual, that he's uh, very likable. And, and talk about that contradiction between someone who seems so charming and yet, on the other hand, can be uh, guilty of such an uh, inconceivable act. That's what makes him so insidious. But you have to understand, he believes everything he says. And his ego is so big that we allowed him, because I, I'm sure he thought that this was an opportunity for him for the first time to tell his story. Maybe he thought he was manipulating us when we were doing this. But he wanted to tell that truth. And as we spent the months with him, and it went on and on and on, he opened up more and he opened up more and he opened up more. I think the hardest part for me personally as a filmmaker, I don't think I could have done it 20 years ago. Because as I was sitting across from him and things would come out of his mouth that just chilled me to the bone and not debate him. The hardest night for me was right after Carolyn Goodman testified, and we went back, and I was trying to find some humanity in this man. Because remember, he didn't act alone. And if to say that we have justice because we put an 80-year-old man in prison uh, doesn't really come close to, to justice, but maybe by telling the truth, it, it gives us some justice. Anyway, Carolyn had testified. This is something she'd been waiting for for her whole life, and it was a very emotional testimony. So that night, I thought, I, he's got to feel something. Okay, and I thought, what could I ask him to see that he had some feelings for a mother losing a child? And I finally said, Edgar, I know you think that they shouldn't have been here and they were outside us and they did all these things, but can't you feel sorry for a mother losing a child? And his response was, well, maybe if she were a good Christian. That was the hardest moment for me not to get out of the chair. Um, but. He, he, we, you know, we did exactly what we told him that we were doing, and that was telling the truth and to make sure that he wasn't the ultimate villain of the story. Because if it wasn't for the governor, and it wasn't for the sovereignty commissioner, and it wasn't for all the rich white folks who patted him on the back, this could never have happened. This is another clip of Neshoba, beginning with Barbara Cheney Daly, the sister of James and Ben Cheney, talking about Edgar Ray Kellen. They should hang him, or whatever, however they kill him in Mississippi, that's the way he should die. Actually, I'd like him buried alive and damned, if you want me to tell you. Who the hell he think he is to take somebody's life? Who died and made him God? And I would like him to tell me what made him think he can kill somebody and get away with it. I'm not a murderer. Right now, I'm the uh, illegal Mississippi official sacrificial lamb. I'd say sacrificial goat. Now, if you talk about sacrificial lambs, those three young men, Swarna, Cheney, and Goodman, were the sacrificial lambs. Sometimes that's all the national news media gets here when they're being driven away. They snap the Ten Commandments, and they try to be sarcastic about it, but we feel proud that they got it. We really believe that in the Ten Commandments. There is no bigger picture of hypocrisy than the Ten Commandments sitting in front of his house. The Ten Commandments are what God is going to judge us by. There is no misunderstanding in thou shalt not kill, whether it's black, white, Jew, communist. He played God. I think he bought into his own image. And so the men in this area looked up to him. That was him in 64. I've known him all my life. He was a 